Greetings in the wonderful name of Jesus. It's that time again for us to get into Wednesday in the Word. And I tell you what, we've started this book of Zechariah. So we're right there in the book of Zechariah. We're going to continue to hear what God is speaking through this particular prophet. Father, we thank you now for this time that we can unite together in the word of God. We thank you for the way you're speaking into our lives. We thank you for the way the Holy Spirit is guiding us through these teachings, Father. And we thank you for the good work that you will continue to do in each of our lives. We pray now as we set our heart to hear your word, to be able to seek your heart, God. May you speak to us. May you open up our eyes of understanding so that we can walk in harmony with the master. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, we're in the book of Zechariah and we started last week and we basically just opened the door to this message that God is speaking through this particular prophet unto Judah in Jerusalem. And today we're going to pick right up where we left off where Zechariah begins to have these eight visions. These visions allow him to see exactly what God is getting ready to do and bringing forth uh, repentance uh, in the hearts of his people uh, through the prosperity and purification that God is taking, uh, carrying out in their lives. So when we pick up in verse number seven the bible reads on the 24th day of the 11th month which is the month sheba in the second year of darius the word of the lord came to zachariah the son of barikah and the son of edo the prophet i saw by night and behold a man riding on a red horse and it stood among the myrtle trees in the hollow and behind him were horses red red sorrel and white then i said my lord what are these so the angel who talked with me said to me i will show you what they are and the man who stood among the myrtle trees answered and said these are the ones whom the lord has sent to walk to and fro throughout the earth so they answered the angel of the Lord who stood among the myrtle trees and said, We have walked to and fro throughout the earth, and behold, all the earth is resting quietly. I call this, Oh, how I love you. How we as humans perceive God's judgment is often accompanied with sadness and sorrow. However, when we see God's judgment through the lens of scripture, we get a witness of God's love of that loving discipline that God brings in order to motivate his covenant people to align their faith with his faithfulness. Here in this first vision of horses communicates God's devotion to Jerusalem. Zechariah saw a man on a red horse standing among some myrtle trees in a ravine. So according to verse 11, this man was the angel of the Lord. The report in verse 11 prompt the angel of the Lord to say with a loud cry in verse number uh, 12, then the angel of the Lord answered and said, O Lord of hosts, how long will you not have mercy on Jerusalem and on the cities of Judah against which you were angry these 70 years? Now, in response to the angel prayer, the Lord delivered an encouraging message predicting the judgment of the nation and the promising of restoration to Judah. When, 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 when God, when this angel looked in the earth, he basically said that the whole earth is resting quietly. We see that in verse 11b. In other words, that there is a calmness, there is a stillness that's taking place in the earth. Evidently, there are no wars and stuff happening at this time. And also, it is a time to reflect that this nation of the nations of the world, they're in a place of complacency in how they are treating God's covenant people. And this is what really gets God's attention, is that evilness, even the nation that he had used as an instrument of his judgment against his covenant people, 
Babylon, but because of their intent and their continual wickedness, God is now reversing things and he is bringing judgment on these nations. Why? Because of his devotion to Jerusalem, his devotion to his people, his covenant people, his love toward them. And so in verse number 13, the scripture says, And the Lord answered the angel who talked to me with good and confident words. So the angel who spoke with me said to me, Proclaim, saying, Thus says the Lord of hosts, I am zealous for Jerusalem and for Zion with great zeal. That is God's attitude toward his covenant people. He is zealous toward them. He is lovingly merciful unto his covenant people. His zeal is that of a warrior coming to protect the people from their enemies. That is the zeal that God has toward his people. And out of that zeal, there is the Lord of hosts, the God who comes to battle in their behalf. Isaiah 42 and 13, listen how the prophet put it. He said, the Lord will march out like a champion, like a warrior. He will stir up his zeal with a shout. He will raise the battle cry and will triumph over all his enemies. And then in Isaiah 59 verse 17, the prophet said, he put on righteousness and his breastplate as his breastplate and the helmet of salvation on his head. He put on the garments of vengeance and wrapped himself in zeal as in a cloak. And so when we see the, the zeal that God has for Jerusalem, he said, I am jealous for Jerusalem. I am devoted to them. I am, I am for them. I am not against them. In verse 15, the scripture says, I am exceedingly angry with the nations at ease, for I was a little angry then, and they helped, but with evil intent. In other words, God's anger toward these nations, these Gentile nations, has been intensified because they are at ease. They feel secure in how they are operating with arrogance toward God's covenant people. Their harsh treatment of God's people has intensified God's anger toward them. Listen, when God is for you, can't no one be against you. And God is for his covenant people. He's for the Jews. He's for Jerusalem. They are the people of his love. They are the people that he has chosen to begin to express his love to mankind. In verse 16 and 17, I call these glorious days are coming. The scripture says, therefore, thus says the Lord. I am returning to Jerusalem with mercy. My house shall be built in it, says the Lord of hosts, and a surveyor's line shall be stretched out over Jerusalem. And again proclaim, saying, thus says the Lord of hosts, my city shall, uh, my city shall again spread out through prosperity. The Lord will again comfort Zion and he will again choose Jerusalem. The Lord speaks of Jerusalem in her glorious future. We see that in verse 16 and 17. He would have mercy on Jerusalem. That's in agreement with the angel's prayer in verse 12. The Bible said, the angel of the Lord answered and said, O Lord of hosts, how long will you not have mercy on Jerusalem? So the angel was praying for God to have mercy on Jerusalem. And we see in verse number uh, 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 15 that God is, is, in verse 16, God is revealing his mercy up on Jerusalem. And the temple in the city, the Bible say, will be built. God say, you know what? This thing is going to get finished. This thing is going to get accomplished. They are having to be stirred up and encouraged to get to work. But God sees the end from the beginning. He knows that it's going to be finished. That's why whenever we are doing something with God, when we are working in agreement with God, God is going to bring it to pass. It's when we're doing our own thing and put God's name on it that a lot of times we'll find out that the plans are frustrated. But that's why it's very important for us to seek the Lord, 
to make sure that we are being motivated by the spirit of God, by the heart of God, and we are joining in with what God is already at work. And so it's going to be rebuilt, the reconstruction being symbolized by the stretching out of a measuring line. And that's what he mentions in verse 16b. And a surveyor's line, that's a measuring line, shall be stretched out over Jerusalem. In other words, the Lord will comfort Jerusalem. He will once again uh, choose it as his earthly dwelling place. And all of the towns of Judah will overflow with prosperity as a result of the renewed blessings of God. That's the message of Zechariah, that God has prosperity that flows through purification. And you are not to walk in the sins of your forefather, but you are to repent and you are to walk in agreement with God's grace and with God's favor because God is spreading out his prosperity over this city. And there's not going to be a way to measure this city. And I believe that looks all the way into the millennia age where there's going to be a number that cannot be numbered, where there are going to be people from every nation, every tongue, and every tribe on the face of the earth. And God's going to gather together this wonderful bride called the church. Jews and Gentiles will be united together in a new kingdom. Hallelujah. This is all going to be done by the Spirit of God, and it's going to be done in God's timing. And the angel is telling Zechariah to proclaim this revelation. That's what he said in verse 14. Proclaim, saying, thus says the Lord of hosts. There go again, the Lord of armies, the Lord of battle. The Lord who knows how to bring to pass his counsel. The Lord who knows how to cause everything that he has ordained, he has predetermined beforehand to come to pass. And all we have to do is walk in harmony with what God is already doing because he's faithful. And he said God's going to bring prosperity to Jerusalem. And the Lord will again comfort Zion and he will again choose Jerusalem as his dwelling place. Saints, we got to rejoice with our Jewish brothers and sisters. Hallelujah. We got to rejoice with what God has already set up to do with Jerusalem. Hallelujah. We're not against our Jewish brothers and sisters. We understand that God has a purpose and plan for them. God has a purpose and plan for all of us who are brought into the faith of Jesus Christ. And he brings us together and he removed that middle wall of division. We are one family in God. But here the writer is speaking specifically relative to Judah uh, and Jerusalem. God's covenant people here. Now in verse 18 through 21, I simply label this God's got it. Then he said, I raised my eyes and looked and there were four horns. Here's another one of those night visions those open visions that Zechariah is getting from the Spirit of God. He said, and I said to the angel who talked with me, what are these? So he answered me, these are the horns that have scattered Judah, Israel, and Jerusalem. Boy, it's amazing how God has this heavenly host working and serving him by giving understanding and revelation unto the prophet. These angels are not talking about themselves. They're not seeking worship or glory. They're not seeking an audience, but they are communicating. They're communicating what God is revealing to Zechariah. They're giving him instructions on what they mean. They're explaining it to him. He's asking them questions. Why? Because that's how God works. When God is doing something, there's no confusion. God speaks in such a way where there's understanding. And then in verse 20, it says, then the Lord showed me four craftsmen. All right. He saw four, four horns at first. And then he said, now the Lord showed me four craftsmen or four smith, uh, 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 smithsmen. And I said, what are these coming to do? So he said, these are the horns that scattered Judah. You got that? The horns scattered Judah. The horns of what? Are those nations, Babylon and Persia, all of them that warred against Judah, that fought against Jerusalem. That's what the horn represents what? Their strength. That's what horns symbolize strength. Their military might attacking God's people. But thank God 
that he showed in full craftsmen. And he said, what are these coming to do? He, so he said, these are the horns that scattered Judah so that no one can lift up his head. But the craftsmen, hallelujah, are coming to terrify them, to cast out the horns of the nations that lifted up their horn against the land of Judah to scatter it. So in this second vision, four craftsmen, agents of, of God's deliverance, overcome four horns, which are symbols of nations that ruled over Jerusalem and scattered, scattered God's people during the exile or into the exile. And then all of a sudden, when you have uh, the, 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 the Lord on your side, it doesn't matter who's on the other side. And that's what God's people are getting a revelation. The, these craftsmen, they are carrying out God's will and they are coming against these nations that have uh, uh, been evil toward God's people. Oh man, I tell you what, you know what Israel is getting a revelation? That God is on our side. Again, when God is on your side, it doesn't matter who's on the other side. And when God is on your side, it doesn't matter who is standing with you. You can have your, your family standing with you and still fail. You can have friends standing with you and still fail. You can have people that are popular, that are prosperous, that are prideful standing with you and still fail. But if God is on your side, you will never fail. And God is on the side of his covenant people. I like Psalms 24. And I've read this before, but Psalms 24, I love reading this psalm because this is a psalm that reminds us of God's faithfulness and what it looks like when God is on your side. This psalm teaches us that at all times that we should be able to look back in our life and answer this question, where would I be today? If the Lord was not on my side, I believe all of us can look back. It's personal now. We look back and we've got some challenges in our past. We've got some trials in our past. We've got some triumphs in our past. But the question becomes, what would my life look like today if the Lord was not on my side? Listen to what the psalmist says in Psalms 124. If it had not been the Lord who was on our side, let Israel now say, if it had not been the Lord who was on our side, when they would have swallowed us alive, when their wrath would have kindled against us. In other words, if it was not for the Lord on our side, our enemies would have destroyed us. Had it not been for the Lord on our side, those who sought our harm, those who tried to uh, 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 strategize evil against us would have overcome us, but they could not do it because the Lord was on our side. He went on to say, then the waters would have overwhelmed us. The stream would have gone over our soul. In other words, if the Lord was not on your side, that circumstance would have overwhelmed you. You would have had a mental breakdown. You would have given up on life. But because the Lord is on your side, you will never fail. No circumstance will be able to overcome you. And then in verse 5, then the swollen waters would have gone over our soul. And then in verse 6, he said, blessed be the Lord who has not given us as prey to their teeth. Our soul has escaped as a bird from the snare of the followers. The snare is broken and we have escaped. Man, if it had not been for the Lord on your side, you wouldn't have gotten out of that situation. And matter of fact, you went in it and, and knowing that it wasn't the will of God, but yet because the Lord was on your side, he brought you out of it. You got in a situation like that, hallelujah, or that even in your disobedience, oh, but yet you cried out to the Lord and what God did. Because he was on your side. He brought you out of that situation. And we should give him the glory. Because just like the Lord has been on your side in the past, he is on your side right now. He'll be on your side tomorrow because that's how faithful God is. And then in verse 8, he sums it up. Our help is in the name of the Lord who made heaven and earth. 
Well, that's what the prophet is making known to God's people, that the Lord is on your side. And those nations that rose up against you, the reason they could not destroy you, because uh, the, uh, the, 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 the reason that Babylonian captivity didn't destroy you, because God had an expiration date on that trial. God had an expiration date on that experience in your life. And yes, he allowed you to go to, through it, but he bought you out of it. And you should give him the glory. You should give him the honor. And your faith should rest in that. That God has made the difference in my life. When I look back in my life, I can declare that had not the Lord been on my side, I would not be here today. I would not be giving him the glory to his name. I would not be standing in where I'm standing now in my life. But it's only because the Lord is on my side. Psalms 118 verse 6 put it like this. The Lord is on my side. I will not fear what man can do unto me. Well, God's covenant people, they get an opportunity to rejoice. Because in the midst of being in a city that's in ruin, there is a future of hope. And so God gives Zechariah these open visions. And these open visions provides encouragement to God's people to let them know that God's got it. He's got your future. Hallelujah. And it looks very blessed. It looks so awesome that you should rejoice right now because God got it. And I want to encourage somebody right now. This is a great place for you to remind yourself that I've entered into a rest. And that means I've entered into a place of my life where I don't allow doubt and unbelief to rule my heart and rule my thoughts. But every time doubt and unbelief tries to come and fear tries to come, I take that thought and I say in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, this is not God's message to me. God's message to me is that I have already overcome by the blood of the Lamb and the words of my testimony. God's message to me is that my light affliction is only but for a moment, but it worketh out for me a far more weight of glory. For I will not look at the things that are seen. Well, the things that are seen are temporal, but the things that are seen through the eyes of faith, they are eternal. And I want to encourage you right now to look unto Jesus Christ with such confident faith knowing that if God be for me, who can be against me or what can be against me? I want to encourage you right now. Hallelujah. This is a prophetic word that God has given to his covenant people concerning the, the, the people of Judah in Jerusalem and concerning the land of Jerusalem, the blessing that God has in store for those people. And you need to be encouraged. Because you're in Christ now. Hallelujah. You're in God's family. And God is faithful to do that which he has promised. So this prophet is not prophesying. He's not prophesying some people want to hear. But man, him and this, these hosts of heaven, these angels, these angelic beings, God is using them to minister to serve Zechariah, to give him the understanding he need, to give him the revelation he need so he can stand up in the midst of a city in ruin and look and declare that God is doing a work that no man can stop. <laughs> this is, this, I tell you what, man, these prophetic books are powerful. And I'm going to let you know right now, with all that's going on in our world, Wars and rumors of war, the suffering, all of these things that's happening in our economy. Don't go point the finger at a man. Don't go point the finger at a, finger at a political party. Don't go point the finger as, oh man, this is all, all this. Look unto the Lord. God's working the work. And believers got to know that. Our times are not in the hands of this world. Our times are not in the hands of world events. Our times are in the hands of our God and our God is strong and mighty and he is the Lord of hosts. He is the God who knows how to do battles. Hallelujah. 
And though the world is in fear, and though the world may be in confusion, we're in a covenant of peace. And we're in a covenant whereby our God has sealed it with the blood of the Lamb. Hallelujah. We're in a covenant where God has given us grace and mercy through Jesus Christ. And therefore we rejoice and we joy in our salvation because of our God. Well, thank God that God is speaking to his people and he's speaking to us. Well, here again, I'm here ministering this Wednesday evening, but Lady Curly has already poured out that wisdom in our midday, noontime, Wednesday in the Word. And I want to encourage you, if you haven't came out and had time to be a part of that, come out, join in from 12 to 1 p.m. Uh, for that Wednesday in the Word, noontime edition. Spiritual food to encourage your faith. So we want to encourage you to keep eating and feasting on the word of God. I have a faith question, just one question, just to challenge, challenge us in our faith. How can God's promises of blessing and protection keep your faith strong and active? That's what the prophet Zechariah is speaking to God's people. God's promise of future prosperity. Yes, there is the need for repentance, and they have repented. They've learned their lesson. We learned that in chapter 1, verse number 6. They, they took ownership of their sins. They've learned their lesson. Now they're walking in, in agreement with God's promises. And as a result, the blessings of the Lord are, are running them down and finding them out. And that's what the prophet Zechariah is speaking to them. But this fact that God has given us promise of blessings and protection should keep our faith strong, should keep us steadfast in faith, persevering in faith, because we got strong faith in God's ability. Well, I want to thank you for joining me for this time of Wednesday in the Word. And God's willing, we're going to come back and we're going to keep listening to what God is speaking to the church. Be encouraged. Our redemption draw it nigh. Keep your eyes fixed upon the Lord Jesus Christ, for he's coming again. God bless you and have a great day.